everyone, it's Alex, and Lukash from Totally Pretentious tagged me in his very own tag, which is the top 10 nonfiction book tag. And it wasn't until watching Lukash's video that I realized just how much nonfiction that I own. And if you've been following me on this channel for a while, you'll know that my approach to reading nonfiction is often me reading memoir or essays. And I think it's because I've always been intrigued by how these specific modes of singular observations kind of help define what nonfiction means. And that can even go beyond beyond just with reading, like with memoir and essays, because it made me think back to my teens whenever I was pretty much the way I was with photography, the way I am now with my reading, as I would be so interested in photography as a form of expression and also study. So ever since I fell in love with photographers like William Eggleston, who I thought really captured the mundane and sense of real life so intimately, now it's made me conceptualize just how heavy the task is of doing something like writing a memoir, just because doing that would obviously take way longer than just trying to capture a photograph that's meant to reflect your life. So when it comes to these approaches of capturing one's life, it made me consider a lot of questions, particularly to nonfiction. So things like, how do I get strangers to even care about me? How do I write about the world that emphasizes curiosity instead of stubbornness? And how do I determine what separates me from writing fiction or autofiction instead of nonfiction? So the 10 books that I'll be naming are ranked, but I wouldn't say they're necessarily my all-time favorite nonfiction books, but they've certainly helped me enrich my thoughts about the genre greatly. So at numbers 10 and 9, I have Regarding the Pain of Others by Susan Sontag and Moments of Being by Virginia Woolf. I consider both of these works highly foundational to sort of what I mentioned earlier about life being this idea of expression and also study. In Sontag's work, she focuses on things like art and war and books, but specifically how the literal production of an image leaves people on both sides of the camera as sort of accomplices to each other to the burden of their own subject Activity. And I love how Sontag sums it up by saying, Narrative makes us understand. Photographs do something else. They haunt us. So this book helped me build that bridge or boundary between observation and projection in reading books, especially with nonfiction. Additionally, Moments of Being by Virginia Woolf is a collection of her autobiographical writing, including a section called A Sketch of the Past, which is her unfinished memoir. Wolf's writing, I think, is always so deliberate in trying to inspect life before it's able to define her, and she discovers this undeniable yet undefinable feeling that she can't quite explain called her own moments of being, which she closely correlates as feelings of shock as the most relevant emotion, and it often happens whenever she's confronted by any moments of death or any familial tension. But alternatively, and what I think is the most interesting is how she defines moments of non-being, like doing chores or any cleaning, but then she also admits that things like writing and reading, which are also mundane, are so much more rewarding and have so much depth. It's just really wonderful having Wolf sort of trace kind of what would eventually become this direct enthusiasm to inspire her own fiction. At numbers eight and seven, I have Bluets by Maggie Nelson and Dear Friend from My Life I Write to You and Your Life by Yi Yun Lee. This tier of my top 10, I think best represents my own sense of of evolving specific topics or ideas over a period or prolonged sense of time. In Blue Wits by Maggie Nelson, she gives over 100 sort of like mini musings on the color blue. It sort of veers into this realm of intimacy that the reader becomes unfamiliar with, even if we are initially talking about something as universal as the color blue. It's really interesting how quickly it feels like reading this can bounce from being dense but also really light with its prose. I always thought of it as like this chimera of poetry in the personal essay and this like underbelly of enthusiasm towards the color blues associations as a historical context of vastness and loneliness, or at least the way Nelson explains it. I found this to be highly immersive and touching and at times even heartbreaking, but always interesting. And I think Dear Friend from My Life I Write to You and Your Life shares a kinship with Bluets in sort of admitting its own sense of self-absorption in terms of how meaningful the subject matter is to the writer and also having a sense of protecting and surrendering intimacy. As Yian Lee navigates her depression, she looks towards books and reading for answers. She takes solace in how her fellow writers have taken themselves out of their experiences and have overcome them, while also admitting the hesitation 
hesitation in that process. So this is part writing process and part memoir, but it's always Lee. I just love her sense of voice, and it's one of the most memorable voices I've read in writing in both fiction and nonfiction. Just because of how insistent she is of not attaching herself into stories, but disappearing into them, and how that changes everything. At numbers six and five, I have Autobiography of a Face by Lucy Greeley and All Will Be Well by John McGarren. These two, I think, are just perfect memoirs at neither sacrificing or second-guessing the difference between emotional truths and factual ones. All Will Be Well goes back to McGarren's childhood while growing up in Ireland while living with his father and as he becomes a deteriorating role model. Autobiography of a Face follows Greeley beginning in her adolescence as she begins to feel a sense of alienation due to her face disfigurement from a form of cancer. Both memoirs portray an innocence stripped away without magnifying victimization or assessing blame to anyone. For McGarren, it was an act of writing in his childhood as a form of escape from his father while also honoring his mother. And for Greeley, it was abandoning sentimentality even toward the death of her father as she's been prepared for death her whole life anyway. I wouldn't say at all that either of them are grateful for their misfortune in their childhood but I do think they write it in a way where they understand why it was meaningful and how it shaped them. Numbers four and three are The Lonely City by Olivia Lang and Pilgrim at Tinker Creek by Annie Dillard. These two are perfect observations for feelings that are more macro versus micro and understanding how possible conceptions of urban versus rural communities can really affect our own sense of ourselves and where our shared emotions exist despite these changes in cultural differences. The Lonely City describes Lang's loneliness while living in New York City by diving into the works of famous artists and examining their influence in her environment and keeping the posterity of that. And Pilgrim at Tinker Creek relies on the experience and expertise of Dillard's musings on nature while in Virginia, and it feels all-consuming and vivid and alive and entirely lonely at the same time. Both books rely on perception, definition and self-reflection that has me returning to them over and over constantly. And finally, at numbers two and number one, I have Blue Nights by Joan Didion and The Liars Club by Mary Carr. I'm a bit biased with these two just because I feel like I've gotten to know Didion and Carr so well through their other works of nonfiction. Blue Nights is a memoir that depicts how comforted yet haunted Didion feels having just lost her daughter, of course, shortly after losing her husband as well, which is what The Year of Magical Thinking is about. And it's wonderful and heartbreaking and beautiful about how Didion is able to distinguish the different types of love she had for her husband and for her daughter. And of course, memory is the driving theme to this book, especially because just thinking about how with the year of magical thinking that came prior to Blue Nights, how I would imagine that Didion felt like a lot of what she had to say, even, of course, the love being different between her husband and her daughter, she thought she'd likely never have to think about again, or at least so soon, within this span of time from each other. I think this book is a great demonstration of the preservation of memory and just how helpful narrative can be to adjusting to what we want out of writing. And finally, we have The Liar's Club, which has Mary Carr place her younger self back in Texas with her family antics. To me, The Liar's Club is this achievement of nonfiction and memoir just because of its admission to failure that feels authentic and organic. The memoir is entirely committed to retaining the memories from Carr's childhood while also giving this wonderful descriptive quality that I could only compare to fiction writers like Marilyn Robinson that exudes this feeling of reading something so American and I don't even know what that really means. The book is also entertaining but without deviating from the linearity that Carr is trying to maintain and she introduces her family like a cast of characters you might meet in fiction but she doesn't cut off their genuine intentions or at times also their misguided violence that Carr believes is what shapes them, or at least shapes them in her eyes, in her memory. With both Carr and Didion, I think they do such an excellent job at the theme of memory and really respecting it, while also making it incredibly endearing for readers. So those are my top 10 nonfiction books, and I would like to tag a few people, Vanessa from Split Reads, Sabrina and Unmanaged Mischief, and Hannah from Hannah's Books. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.